everyone. My name is Madison Vanderclay. I'm the Senior Associate for Public Policy here at SVLG, and it's my honor today to present our final panel of the day, uh, Funding Founding Female. We have put together a fantastic panel of women to dive into the issues and solutions for women looking to found successful companies. Amy Allison is founder and president of She the People, an organization that brings together women of color to transform the national political debate. In 2019, she organized and moderated the first presidential forum dedicated to issues specific to women of color. Welcome, Amy. Jessica Chen is co-founder of Defy Pay Network, which is democratizing access to cryptocurrency. Through fighting the high transaction fees charged to buyers, they aim to bring financial inclusivity to over 1.6 billion people. Welcome, Jessica. Julian Guthrie is a journalist, author, and the founder and CEO of Alfie, a new company that connects women of all backgrounds with the goal of advancing together. Welcome. And moderating our panel today is Laura Wilkinson, SVP and Head of Communications for SBLG. Over her career, she's managed communications for politicians, leading policy think tanks, and Fortune 500 companies. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. And just a note for uh, being our authentic self, I'm recovering from a broken wrist, so <laughs> hence the splint. Um, so um, I'm really excited to be here for this final conversation where we're gonna really dig into helping to demystify the big questions around how do you raise funds? You've got a great idea and you're a female who wants to start a company. How do you navigate these spaces? How do you really help make sure that you're connecting with the right investors, that you're asking the right questions and that you're bringing your best self to the room? And so the women who are sitting here before me have really helped to kind of blaze those trails they're also, in doing so, making sure that they're opening the doors for others. So I think we're really gonna gain some important insights from this conversation, so I'm really excited. So I think to just kind of dive in, um, I know some of the conversations we've had today have been kind of talking about how the pandemic has really helped to um, lay bare some of the disproportionate burdens that women have faced in the workplace and in life in terms of navigating family care, whether that's children or sick ones or elderly parents. Um, but there are some bright signs. I think with, with the great C session um, and sort of this new flexible work environment, we are seeing now more women-led companies started. We're seeing, according to PitchBook, we're seeing um, more funding for women-led and co-founded companies. We're also seeing women-led incubators. And it's starting to be exciting to see women signing checks for other women. So I'd love to kind of do a little bit of a lightning round to kind of help us see from your experience either raising money or kind of being in the industry, how are you seeing, are you seeing signs of progress? Are you seeing it um, get any easier or kind of help us demystify what it's like to raise funds? Um, I heard a, um, a joke last night and I'll share that first from a founder. He, I said, how are you doing? How are you sleeping? He said, well, I'm a first time founder, so I'm sleeping like a baby. I wake up and cry every two hours. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I was like, I completely relate to this. Um, no, it's, um, you know, I see many more women uh, becoming founders, starting their first companies, uh, which is fantastic. More women as funders on the VC side, but the numbers are still really pretty abysmal. Uh, I wrote a book called Alpha Girls about a group of women in venture capital who uh, were succeeding and helped finance and build some of the foremost companies of our day, and you'd never heard their stories. And at the time, this was around 2016 when I started reporting this, 94% uh, of all uh, check writing VCs were men, 2% of all VC dollars went to women founded companies. And out of great frustration come great companies. So I was really motivated from that. I wanna be one of these risk takers. I wanna come up with a solution for a problem that I saw. Uh, so the numbers are still similar to that. Women are starting to make more inroads. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is progress. It's not where it needs to be. And 
We need to, I hope that everyone here walks away with some idea about how to advance uh, something you're passionate about, a company, support a woman founder, uh, you know, and the, and the role of the funders cannot be underestimated too. So progress, but a long way to go. Great, Jessica. Well, good afternoon. So I think I'm, I, I actually have a lot of experience to share with this. I am on my second startup, and before my first startup, I was a finance executive at banks and insurance companies. So I have quite a journey to um, come from somebody who does financial modeling all the time to somebody who's pitching and selling uh, all the time. My journey, I was very fortunate in my fundraising with the VCs are I have sponsors and mentors. And they are actually both male. Um, these are two very well um, achieved, very successful to managing partners, investors, and board members in the Valley. And I happened to be working with them in my previous positions for a long time. And they like the way how I operate. So my fundraising journey started with I preparing decks and exact summaries and a paragraph of describing what um, we're doing, and they will send personal emails to their contacts. And sometimes I would go to meetings, they would tell me, my mentors would say, you should talk to this person, even though they're not gonna write you a check, they will point you to where somebody would. Um, one lesson I learned from pitching to VCs is that you have to identify the VCs that already agree with your pain point. It is impossible to convince somebody that this is a pain point, they don't see it. VCs only invest in the pain points they agree on. Um, the second thing I would say, Bay Area is some, some, it's a place that's truly unique in that people are very willing to do a coffee with you, uh, meet up with you just to open up their network. So do not hesitate to ask uh, people to do an intro for you. And people are much colder with cold calls and cold emails, but if it's a warm intro, it goes a very, very long way. So use, that, use those networks. <laughs> yes. Great, and Amy, over to you. Hi everyone. I recently read a book called The EOS Life, which is Entrepreneur Operating System that gives a framework to think about those of us who dive in as entrepreneurs, take risks, um, and do something different as an expression of ourselves. And in this book, it says, look, if you are a person who's an entrepreneur or founder, here's your goal. Here's like, here's like the end goal to work 100% on what you love to do, 100% of the time. 100% of the people you work with, you love. I know a lot of us are really far from that right now. <laughs> um, being adequately compensated or appropriately, com appropriately compensated and your work makes a difference to the world. So I'm gonna talk about the fourth thing. All of them are important. Um, for me, who comes from the world of advocacy, politics, public service. I had been working both in the private sector, the public sector for a long time and had this idea that became um, pressing for me over a course of seven or eight years that there were a group of us in this country who weren't listened to. We were the, we were the, 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 the we suffered the most of the policies and practices of this country. We were the lowest on every measured, uh, from economic to other kinds of measures in this country. Uh, we, we, we contributed the most in terms of the civic and social life. We volunteered, we got people out um, to vote. We were civically minded, and yet we were the least represented in terms of elected leadership. And when we put that together, that's 20% of the population, the least represented a uh, group of people who had the most to offer this country. Now this idea lived on my shoulder, like just out of sight for a really long time, and I ignored it. Um, I was advising how to spend $10 million 
$10 million in political spending in Arizona for, uh, to, to activate uh, particularly Latino, but also black and Latino voters. And I recognized that I had the experience, but there was no other organization that was focused on black, Asian American, Pacific Islander, indigenous, uh, and Latinas, women of color. No one, no one. Um, so not only did I have to find people who were willing to fund an effort to elevate the political power of this group who wasn't, like, was never in the paper, no one talked about, no one really valued, um, I had to convince people of a possible future to get them to write checks. So now I have two organizations, a nonprofit and then a C4, which does political work. And it is, the, uh, it is first and foremost leaning into people that already thought, especially with Trump in office, what is it that we missed? Wh why? What is the situation? Why is there somebody who um, is advancing policies that aren't, aren't serving women? What, what is going on in this country? And I could come in with a possible future for us all. And it was in leaning into those relationships that I could go from a person who would advise on a $10 million you know, ad and political program spend to my own effort. And I remember, I was like, I can't, I can't raise money. I don't really know how to raise money. But when the first person wrote the check for $50,000, which at that time was like incredible for me, something, uh, the dam broke in terms of my own heart and capacity. Um, we believe in this country. We believe in women of color. There are people there, so now I gotta find my people. And so the, that's the long way of me saying that uh, it's not a private company, it's an expression of, uh, of this work in these organizations, but it still requires leaning into, like carrying a vision and holding that vision and leaning into the relationships and just going for it. I, you know, I, I, I um, heard several times today, uh, the, the, the secret to being a founder is it's, there's no word no, it's just not yet. <laughs> um, and you have to keep, there's something in you that has to be that persistent person yep. that is dedicated to finding your people. No, that's so powerful, thank you. Um, you know, it's about how do you identify whether it's the idea or the, the business plan and the networks, and it's really about sort of having that power and principle and then connecting it to the right people who are gonna help you drive that mission forward. Um, so I think we'd like to now just kind of t tailor questions for each of you. Um, so Julian, you as a leader have really had a unique set of experiences. You've been a journalist and an author, and now you've kind of taken the leap and founded your own company that is focused on advancing women. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've, we see is that, um, particularly since there are a lot of on-roads and off-ramps and on-ramps for women in their careers, that we develop skills that may be transferable, but sometimes we're kind of fixated mm -hmm. on this idea of, here's my career path, this is kind of the way to get from, a to, from point A to point B, but um, maybe we should be looking at them in terms of pivots and how to kind of take those skills and do something else with them. How, how have you kind of applied that mentality and how do you think that maybe women and men vary in, in how they sort of think about their career at a macro level? Well, it's a great question. And I do look at, uh, I look at my journey as, as more of a continuum, even though it seems, okay, you were a journalist forever, then you're an author, and now you're the founder and CEO of Alfie, and how did that happen? Was this a crazy detour? And again, I do look at it very much as a continuum. So. I look at what, what is the underlying skill that I have. Mm -hmm. And I developed it you know, because I worked hard at it every single day for literally 20 years, and that is storytelling. And this is something that you both touched on, is mm -hmm. you know, when you're going out for funding, when you're talking about starting a company, what, is, what story are you trying to tell? Now we're going out for our first customers. How do we help companies tell their story? How do we help companies be representative 
repre represent themselves as a place where women want to work and love to work. Uh, we have an AI communication tool. So how do I use my storytelling skills, my obsession with words, uh, to, to, to help build this tool. I, don't, I didn't have a background in AI, but I have a background in communication. I have a background in writing. I have a background in storytelling. So look at something that you have that is your superpower, that is something you're passionate about, and how can it carry you forward to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing? Answering the second part of your question was, what's the difference between uh, genders, potentially, uh, anecdotally? Uh, I would say, and I think everyone here would probably nod in agreement, is that uh, women want to check every single box. And you know, we know, we should know that perfection is not our friend. And risk taking is so important for women. You know, what I'm doing, yes, it's, it's, it's risky in that I hadn't done this before, uh, but no risk, no reward. So it's, it's not checking every single box. Uh, it is believing that you're going to figure it out, as in, you know, if you don't know, you don't know yet, but you will go and, and, and figure it out. So again, think about what is that underlying skill that you have, this passion that you have, and how can it carry, carry you forward uh, and open one door after the other? Great, thank you. Yeah, that, that self-belief, I think, is so important, but also knowing and tapping into those skills is really um, I think something that we've heard throughout the day today is about the competency and the confidence and how do you kind of take those with you. And, and working hard, you. working harder, right. you know, it's, it's assiduous in application. It's a Japanese principle of Kaizen where you get a little bit better each day and all of those incremental gains add up to something significant. Excellent. Um, so Amy, she the People, your organization is, as you said, really focused on how do you really connect and, and ensure that women of color have not only a seat at the table, but that their issues are prioritized. We know that's something that's equally of important in the, the corporate world. But also, let's be real, it's an election year. It's a midterm year, but it's an election year. And perhaps at no other time have we seen issues of that, that directly impact women and women's equality more so. Um, how are you thinking about kind of connecting um, women and lifting them up? And how do we sort of take some of the lessons from the political world and, and apply them to the business world? I feel really strongly that um, uh, in order for women, particularly women of color, to be, to take, uh, step fully into our leadership, and power, not only personally, but uh, uh, you know, more broadly mm -hmm. in politics and business, um, we need to change our culture. When I started this work, um, women of color were invisible, but women of color are the majority of women in this state. There are majority of women in the San Mateo County, the majority of women in New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Texas, Florida, Georgia, all the places that we consider across the country who will determine the future of the country. We're the majority of women. We're not minorities. And the way that we shift our thinking opens up new possibilities for us. You know, we're moving into a, a, a place in this country where no one's going to be the majority. In terms of numbers, there's more Latinas in California in the country than other women of color, but honestly, for Americans to move forward, we need to uh, operate and think in a multiracial way, working for a multiracial democracy. That's how it will be stabilized and healthy for people's votes to be counted and things like that. That's a shift in mentality in a time where uh, so much of what we heard over the last years was seeking to separate and break us down. So when we talk about uh, you know, when we talk about building connections across uh, race, across intersectionality, you know, no matter what you do for a living or what your walk of life, we have some common values that we need to assert and, and, and talk about is, it, it, particularly this year. I mean, here, the, the, the reality is that, uh, you know, our freedom, our freedom to, to pursue our dreams, our, our freedoms to control our body, our freedom 
uh, uh, to be safe, those things are at stake. And I think those are the common themes that we can talk about as women and we can organize on politics. I mean, the things that are wrong with this country are way bigger than politics. Do we? <laughs> it's way bigger than politics. It's not like one election or one political party will solve the thing. Right. Um, so when I, when I say all that, I say, you know, how can we adopt a language and a way of being that gives us space uh, to come together in new ways as Americans? and give space for women of color who have been both ignored, silenced, and have, have suffered in this country to take lived experience and not make them off to the side or unelectable, but it's the very experience of being excluded and feeling like they don't belong and suffering and, and going into heavy debt and not having their voice taken seriously. All that experience qualifies them for leadership and actually the country needs us. And when we start shifting in that way, it opens up the possibility. The organization I found, She the People, helps to, uh, helps to solidify both that way of being and the possibility. So there would be no way, for example, Kamala Harris would be in the White House without the organizing of She the People and others to say, we have to have a woman of color in, in the White House because women of color are uh, the majority of Democrats in every state that matters that's gonna determine who wins the White House. Um, and in, in, in this uh, upcoming midterm, women of color will determine who is the majority in the state house, governor, you know, um, and in the Senate. And so those are the ways of thinking that make things possible. And as an entrepreneur, as a founder, I find myself like, if, if, we can, if we can open our minds to this possibility, now all of a sudden we can see something else mm -hmm. is there. And, and then an organization comes and says, we can help to uh, make this country better in this way. We can bring more people in. We can help, uh, we can help um, uh, have tighter relationships between uh, political relationships and other kind of relationships between different groups at a time we need them is more possible. And I, you know, I think that's, that's the spirit that I, I come into this, mm -hmm. this year with. A lot is at stake, but a lot is still very possible. And um, I think right now, in terms of being a founder, like we just spent, we did a listening session over 10 states, including California. We went and met with women of color, particularly in the Central Valley. Um, and in LA, where, uh, but also in, in 10 other battleground states. This is what we heard. We're tired. And we don't know if voting is going to make a difference. And I have to make sure that people understand actually it's the biggest difference right now. Mm -hmm. um, and have people still believe in a system even if people are feeling cynical or, or exhausted. No, I think the we're tired does resonate with a lot of people. You know, I think particularly after the, the pandemic and the disproportionate weight that women have shouldered um, navigating through these spaces has been challenging. But I think just one plug, it was National uh, Voter Registration Day this week. So if you're not registered to vote, you should go out and do so. Uh, yes. <laughs> because it does matter. Um, check your yeah. vote. If you've moved or changed locations, you know, please do things to uh, register to vote. Um, but, um, you know, I think the idea of how do we kind of bridge and think about this at a societal level and kind of bringing those leadership skills of women and women of color to different spaces, I think is something that we can all take um, lessons from and sort of that, you know, digging deep <laughs> and really persevering. Um, thank you. Uh, Jessica, let me turn to you now. Yep. Um, you know, in your career, you briefly mentioned that you've really navigated spaces that have been traditionally male, very male dominated, right? FinTech and insurance, you sort of think of those as very male dominated. How have you um, kind of honed your own leadership style when you look around and you have a lot of your counterparts or um, leaders around you are male? Um, and how do you, as a woman, then sort of tap in and develop your own leadership style? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you asked that because it does not, it's something that didn't cross my mind often, mm. but thinking bad, that was so true. So I work at this large financial institution for about 10 years, um, was promoted to an executive position and was leading special projects, identifying which other companies to buy. So what I am in charge of is I have 10 other senior VPs in my working group that I need to get them around, gather them every month and have them review the, the target companies. They're all men. So I will walk into the meeting, 10 other men, and I am an Asian woman. They will all be talking about sports. I remember one of the senior um, leader asked me, so Jessica, which sport do you follow? And I don't. So my answer is, the only sports I follow is the Real Housewives franchise. <laughs> They did not get the joke at all. They had no idea what it is. <laughs> uh, so how did I go from there, um, somebody who's kind of being dismissed, to I got the comments like, I am timid, I'm too aggressive. Like There is a, somehow a special spot that a woman can be successful and can act properly in their eyes. But how I overcame that um, is, then I, um, I kind of went for another opportunity. I went to an innovation organization. I started this project and every other month, I will go in front of all the C-level uh, people and ask for funding. Did that for over two years, end up spending $10 million on this. How did I did it? It's not a natural skill for me. I started watching a lot of TED Talks and I would encourage you to uh, search for a specific TED Talk that's uh, by the producer of Finding Nemo. Um, it's, it's a movie filmmaker and that's a fantastic TED Talk. And I, so I started to thinking more from a storytelling, like a movie kind of approach. Uh, I started to use, I remember in one of my presentations, I used Star Wars as my opening uh, to kind of help them understand how Star Wars are kind of like Jedi's. They are just looking up, looking for their place in this world. Um, and that is the moment I started to finding the power of storytelling is you don't, I don't need to like sports, but I can still connect mm -hmm. with these people. Even though they're men, they love sports. Um, and being funny, try to insert a joke somewhere uh, also helps. The second thing I found, and this is after I had my startup, um, I was asked by my board members to speak at events like this. And there is one particular event I got a lot of feedback. And the feedback is they were, the audience were touched because they felt I was being vulnerable. I am not just here sitting here being confident I know what I'm doing. I am very honest with my struggles, even though I did not wake up crying every morning, but I do <laughs> go to sleep thinking about my startup. And the first thought when I open my eyes is my startup. And, um, and has sharing that, especially with people who have not tried entrepreneurship before, they think, Oh, I thought of the Uber idea as well. How come I did not go after that? There is a gazillion steps between an idea to bring something into life. And so I think just being authentic, and this is my journey. I used to have to write scripts to like every presentation, starting from asking well for funding in a financial institution, to now I can just talk because I have gone through fundraising. I pitched to 100 VCs. I've done all formats of pitches from elevator pitch to 30 minutes to, uh, to one hour to plug and play. They have this setup of a speed dating type of a pitch, like pitches like you go through. So I think just practice. And there might be a different way of view that you can connect and influence others. And I think storytelling is a very, very powerful one. Mm -hmm. 
I think certainly this idea of storytelling is really coming through from each of you about how do you really connect, whether it's a company or whether it's a pain point or whether it's you know sort of a societal challenge, and how do you then connect that to an organization or a, a business idea of how we're going to try to solve that, right? And so how do you understand and look in around and say, who's my audience? How do I build that connection, right? Those bridges, because exactly, yeah. it's not just about having the best idea, it's about having an idea that resonates and that is compelling, right? And so um, I think practicing, finding the networks, the folks who are gonna help you drive that forward is certainly sort of unlocking that key. <laughs> that it is, and there's a, there's a saying that I like, for women in particular, and it's, it's not boasting when it's based on fact, and you know we need to be better at telling our stories. Mm -hmm. But the, the pitches, the fundraising, I think it's very easy when you start out as a founder to underestimate the pressure, uh, the relentlessness you have to have, the um, no's that you're going to hear again and again and again until it's a yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you only need you know, a few to get on your side, the right allies yep. uh, to join. But it is a constant honing. I'm on now, I think, version 68 of my pitch deck. And <laughs> so you just have to go back and revise and revise and revise. And it's, you get better and better at telling your story. Yep. And it's a great thing whether you, are, whether you have a company or not, but to think about that elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that you're trying to convey? Where are you in your life? How do you do it in 30 seconds or under? And, uh, and then encourage those around you to tell their stories as well. It's so much storytelling. It's a lot of storytelling. Yeah. I was, you know, um, it took, I had most of my professional career without running my own organization, but working for other guys, I mean guys. Um, and uh, I had a lot of, the messages that came from the ether and society or culture that were embedded. It was like I was carrying around for myself. Like, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? So um, uh, storytelling is very important. Uh, seeing people's important. Admitting when you don't know what you're doing is also for women. For, you know, there's a, a very liberating. Yeah. I advise a lot of candidates. I advise Senate statewide, like uh, Secretary of State or gubernatorial candidates, uh, uh, Senate candidates, uh, and state legislative, uh, statewide candidates. Um, here's the common element for, for women of color run in these spaces. It's common. It doesn't matter. You can just think of like your, your most famous politician that's a woman of color right now. It's <laughs> also with her. Uh, I like I'm like people like learning to look at yourself from the eyes of someone who judges you and doesn't think you're worthy. Now, how do we overcome that in order to have the confidence to go forth and 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 say this is this is a way uh, it should be? I did the op-ed project. Has anyone done that? Uh, uh, women, women are the least represented on the opinion pages of like New York Times or just you just name it Politico or, or any of the places. Women are not published that often. And uh, if, we're, if you're on the op-ed pages, it opens up all kinds of influence, at least in my world and probably your world too. If you're working for a company and you publish something and I don't know, Fortune Money, I don't know, some other magazine, crypto finance something, you have status. So it's something that that uh, the fact that we're underrepresented is, is uh, important to note. So the op-ed project has a one-day training for, for women, how to get into opinion, how to get published. And uh, they had us do an exercise. There was like maybe like 15 of us in the class. They had us do an exercise and it said, introduce yourself and your area of expertise. And each person who introduced their area of expertise, it was like, like I introduced myself, I'm Amy Ellis, and I'm, a, I'm an expert in Oakland politics. <laughs> I just told you who I advise. I'm an expert in Oakland politics. I live in Oakland. I'm an expert in national American politics. 
but I didn't claim it. And I was not that unusual. Every single woman said, this is my, they feel like they have to have a PhD plus an MBA plus 30 years of experience <laughs> just to say, now guys do, are not saddled with this because they don't learn to judge themselves from the eyes of anyone who thinks they're not worthy. They just say, you know what? I know a little about it, good enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna write 700 words and get it in the Washington Post. And guess what? They may not get 100% of the time, but, but they, they get a lot shot. of time. They take the shot. Yep. So we have to develop the capacity as women, as women of color, to diffuse the power of the voice that tells us that we're not worthy, who do we think we are, da, 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 by learning to look at us from the eyes of someone who is for you, your people, 100%, no matter what. You're successful, you fall on your face, they're like cheering you on. You look at yourself in that way and you go for it and claim a very broad range of expertise, even the stuff that you think makes you seem like, you know, somebody went to jail. Like my brother went to jail for 20 years. I thought, I'm very embarrassed with that. I don't want to explain that. But actually having a, a sibling who has that experience qualifies me to be able to talk about what the criminal justice system does to families. So to claim expertise, no matter what your experience is, is the thing that prepares you to go on and do and found the thing and tell the story and claim it and then you're not pulling on your hair and adjusting your clothes and wondering if <laughs> if if your voice sounds Doing good or, or wondering if you're good enough like forget about that statistic we have over 5,000 years of recorded history 0.5 percent of that has been dedicated to the stories of women so we all here have to be a part of changing that yeah. That is <laughs> stunning when you think yeah, about it, yeah. but just... It's a big motivator. It is. It shouldn't be, you know, it's, it's depressing, but it should be galvanizing. Yep. Same with companies. Many companies, including Alfie, born out of frustration mm -hmm. that tools don't exist, that platforms don't exist, that uh, communication tools don't exist that are specifically targeted at, uh, at, a, at, a, at a certain problem, a pain point. Yeah. Yeah. I think... Um, uh, like at this moment, I was still adjusting my hair and all that. Um, and I found this <laughs> like the, the stage to be slippery, but I'm still comfortable. I'm still comfortable and I am comfortable because um, throughout this kind of journey of being a female entrepreneur, I know I can learn anything. I have, you know, now I can speak to a technology like a software deck like architecture very fluently. I can speak about crypto um, and blockchain very fluently. I can learn to pitch and I can learn to sell um, to Fortune 500 companies. And so just know that you're way awesome and more capable than you think you are. And if there's anything or any skill you don't have right now, you can absolutely learn it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, before we open it up for audience questions, which I'm sure we have a few of, um, I'm just going to um, take the moderator's <laughs> privilege and just say one one thing we hear, and you know, I think we've seen some, let's just say, stunning um, discrepancies in the expectations that women have in terms of how do we navigate failure, whether that's public or private. Um, you know, we often hear the term for male founders in particular to fail fast and to fail upward. But women can often look at failure as an albatross or as something that sort of stops us dead in our tracks. How do you persevere? You touched on this briefly, Julian, when you hear no or when you kind of navigate through that adversity. Is there, is there any advice you have for the folks in the audience here or joining us online? What is some of that, that advice or those sort of mantras that you channel when you're really kind of navigating through those no's or having to revise your deck for the 60 <laughs> something time? How do you kind of tap in? What are you talking about? I, I had a lot of experience in rejection as an author. Even though I had a long career in journalism, uh, when I went to sell books, I would get, you know, we'd get 10 rejections first and I'd think, oh my God, this is a terrible book. <laughs> There's nothing redeeming about it. And then the 11th agent, or uh, sorry, the 11th editor would be like, this is the best 
uh, book I've ever read. I love it. You nailed the protagonist. It's so great. So that was the lesson. Okay, so you may, you may go through 10 rejections and you're feeling very dispirited. And you, you also, there's a temptation to go back and revise what you've done and basically the underlying story. And it's very similar in raising money for a company and selling a company and pitching to all of those you end up put, pitching to. You have to believe in the central storyline of what it is and hold on to that. Listen, listen to everybody, listen to all the feedback, but hold on to what that storyline is. So I was very prepared for this tough road uh, as being a founder through, again, continuum through this experience I had uh, as, as an author. And you know you have to believe in it and persevere with it. And I would also say that this is something that is, it takes a lot of stamina uh, to do things that are really hard in life. So take care of yourself and believe in it. Take time for yourself. Be good to the people around you. Um, and, and stamina. You have to take care of yourself. This is, this is an arduous journey, but it is an incredible one of opportunity. It's not easy. You know, it's not for the faint of heart, um, but it's just incredibly, re in, incredibly rewarding already where we are to go from idea to product to something that's going to market that can impact people's lives in a positive way. I just want to give, I know we're running at time here, but um, Jessica or Amy, any final words or advice that has really kind of guided you as a North Star? Um, failure is part of success. Failure isn't the end of success. It is part of success. At my 20th um, reunion at Stanford, we, we organize, usually they'll have like a class panel, and then they'll have famous people, very successful, people like Cory Booker was in my class, okay? Sitting senator, it's like usually, usually these folks who have, you look at them and you put them on a pedestal and you say, they're successful, they haven't failed. But if you like scratch the surface, you recognize that failure was, um, it's certainly on my, has been on my journey. I've failed a bunch of times. And the thing that is like getting okay with failure as just part of the process has helped me to become resilient. Um, resilient. Like you didn't get the money this time or they didn't like you this time. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. I'll just start again tomorrow. That's okay. And you got to develop that capacity right. in order to, right. to, uh, to continue on the path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they both said so well about uh, about failure. I'll I'll just leave you with a completely different thing. Um, I often thought of this instead of I have two kids, and uh, my friends gave me wonderful baby showers, and I often thought of what if we do new career or new business showers mm. Mm. when we have a um, a friend, a colleague who's starting a new position, a new career, a new business. Let's gather around and bring our resources to celebrate and to really help each other, right? Um, I often thought of things in the world of business that there's so much about network, about resources. Let's do that for each other. Yeah. Love it. Well, I think that's, that's very powerful, and let's try to channel that all in our personal networks as well. So thank you, each of you, for bringing your perspectives and your power of storytelling to us today. Um, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.